America, land of the free and home of the Whopper. Oh wait, Burger King is Canadian now, isn't it? Anyway, welcome to what I hope will be a beloved series, a straight up US history series. Today, we're going to go all the way back, like tens of thousands of years ago, to the first time humans called the Americas home. I'm Tristan Johnson and this is Step Back History. Be sure to click the subscribe button as well as the bell notification to never miss a new Step Back video or live stream. Okay, let's go as far back as we possibly can. For about half to 80% of human existence, the Americas were devoid of human life. At some point, somewhere between 60 and 18,000 years ago, this is still hotly debated, humans made it into what is today Alaska via a land bridge connecting Alaska to Asia. Some people claim that this has been debunked, but the only recent developments that change this narrative at all are how many of these migrations occurred and that there was likely not a Canadian ice-free corridor in Alberta. We also can't dismiss some evidence showing that people made it to the Americas through other routes than the land bridge, though they are in the extreme minority. There's significant evidence to believe that Polynesians made it to the Americas, albeit much later, and that some Asian groups made it to the Americas after the flooding of the land bridge via boats. As the last ice age began to end, glaciers covering much of the North American continent began to retreat. Following game animals and the coast, early ancestors of today's indigenous peoples began to expand south. This isn't a race for the southern tip of South America, but a slow process, taking centuries, as people migrated, expanded, settled, and diversified down the continent. They reached the bottom of South America about 11,000 years ago. Now, the ending of the Ice Age was a tumultuous time for the planet and its inhabitants. The climate change, though slower than the one occurring today, was still quick in evolutionary time, and many plants and animals had a hard time adapting to it. Many of the massive Ice Age animals, through a changing environment and overhunting by ancient humans, went extinct about 9,000 years ago. These were some truly massive beasts, such as the giant bison, ancient horses, and the woolly mammoth. The land bridge connecting Asia and the Americas also closed due to rising ocean levels, sealing off contact between these two continents. About the same time that agriculture began to show up in the Middle East, it started to develop in Mexico and in the Andes Mountains. The basis for their agriculture was three principal crops that define the continent. Corn, beans, and squash. In the Andes, they also began to eat potatoes and quinoa. However, it was limited compared to farming in Eurasia due to a lack of beasts of burden for muscle power and fertilizer. That being said, they did construct impressive infrastructure projects such as massive cities, roads, irrigation systems, trade networks, and massive pyramids. You can find out a little more about this in a video I did in 2017 on native technologies with Soliloquy. These are impressive, but unlike the Europeans who would come to invade their territory, they didn't invent metal tools and machines, gunpowder, or long distance navigation. Come to think of it, Europeans didn't invent any of those either. It was all imported technology. The sizes of these pre-Columbian societies were truly impressive. Tenochtitlan, the city at the center of the mighty Mexica or Aztec Empire, boasted a population of 250,000. At the time of conquest, it was one of the world's largest cities, rivaling the largest cities in Europe. At the center was the massive pyramid, the Templo Mayor, which itself was based on breathtaking titanic pyramids built by an earlier civilization called Teotihuacan. As someone who has been to both sites, they are true marvels. If you ever want to travel and see cool ancient stuff, take a trip to Mexico City. In modern day Peru existed a mighty Inca empire. Its population was as large as 12 million and was organized through a connected road network that spanned over 3,200 kilometers, or 2,000 miles for you Yankees. In my home country of Canada, indigenous groups lived in virtually every part of the massive country, including the far north where Inuit people lived and hunted in the frigid climate for millennia. 
literally building homes from the ice. In what would become the US, civilizations had never developed to quite the scale of the Incas or Aztecs. Though, before the first pyramid was built in Egypt, massive dirt mounds were built by an ancient people in modern day Louisiana. This site was a trading metropolis, containing copper from Canada and flint from Louisiana. This indicates a massive north-south trading network, likely following the Mississippi River. To talk about the various cultures of the Americas, though, would take me all day. They did not have any major collective sense of identity. The pan-native identity is a post-conquest construction made by Europeans. Indigenous peoples of the Americas spoke literally hundreds of mutually unintelligible languages. Some societies in South America and Mexico had writing, but largely these civilizations didn't have writing systems. However, many North American cultures had developed maps. In the land that would become the United States, there was, especially in the eastern part of the continent, some cultural similarities. One example is the use of land and property. Village leaders would give families plots to use for a season or more, or claim areas for hunting. But these were rights on land use, not land itself. The concept of owning territory wasn't part of their culture, and unowned land was considered in common for everyone. There was also little value in accumulating wealth or resources. If you were a semi-nomadic people moving every few years as soil and game depleted, possessions made little sense. There was still social status, with chiefs mainly coming from a select few families and living a more splendid lifestyle than the rest of the tribe. Some, such as the Natchez people, even had a small nobility class. But for most societies, things like wealth just didn't mean as much. They cared more about social status and reputation. One way to build such a reputation was through generosity. So gift giving was often a big deal. Often trading had as much of a cultural dimension as a practical one. Gender was also performed entirely different in these societies than in their European invaders. Extended family membership was a bigger deal than nuclear families. Family membership was often matrilineal as fathers played less a role in their child's upbringing. Premarital sex was not a problem, and divorce was perfectly acceptable. Tribal leaders were oftentimes men, but women often were part of the council that chose them. Women could own stuff, and men join women's families when married. The division of labor was also quite often delineated on gendered lines. Women maintained homes and farmed while men fished and hunted. Further east, where hunting was less important, men would take over farming duties. There was also a third gender in many of these societies. Members of this third gender would often have some of the rights and privileges of one gender, but the clothing and work of another. It's highly contextual and speaks to a complex world surrounding gender. But it seems to have been and still is part of indigenous culture. Today, they're collectively called two-spirited. And trust me, I am glossing over a lot in my description here. The land that would become the United States has a wide variety of geographical regions that necessitated different lifestyles. In Arizona, the ancestors of the Zuni and Hopi settled for about 3,000 years. They built large planned towns with sizable multifamily dwellings. Some of these dwellings, like the Pueba Belinta site in New Mexico, was five stories tall and held over 600 rooms. Buildings this size wouldn't return to the continent until about 1880. They also practiced desert agriculture, which meant impressive irrigation systems, dams, and canals. The Pacific coast contained the densest variety of people with fishing and hunting salmon and sea animals, a common food source. On the other side of the Rockies, plains peoples hunted on foot the bison that populated the region with just a little bit of farming. On the east coast all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to Canada were their own batches of indigenous groups. They mainly subsisted off squash, beans, and corn, which grew together in these impressive plots. They also would fish and hunt deer, turkeys, and other animals. These groups would go to war over goods, captives, or for revenge. With war also came diplomacy. This region was mostly city-states with little central authority until the invasions by Europeans forced them to gather into various leagues or confederations. One exception would be the very ancient Iroquois Confederacy, but I think they should be a video all their own. Religion in what would become America also followed a few common characteristics. Many had ceremonies surrounding farming and hunting, but were steeped in something called animism. 
It's a belief that spiritual power suffuses the whole world and that spirits exist in everything, living or not. Many times they believed in a single creator, but without much details on them. Often they were practiced by some sort of holy man, a shaman or a medicine man. And it's this society Europeans encountered when they made it to the Americas. Europeans used what they saw as backwardness as a justification for their conquest. Often they saw these people in extreme terms, either as noble savages, almost better but simpler than Europeans, or as uncivilized, brutal monsters. First descriptions of them are as beautiful and tall, probably because their lifestyle actually resulted in a healthier diet than most Europeans received. Indigenous people saw Europeans as small, weak, and hairy. Probably smelly too, as they had a hmm, different relationship with bathing. Over time, the Europeans began to just see the brutal, uncivilized image as there was more and more of their land they wanted excuses for taking. They often talked about the need to convert these people to the quote, true religion, thinking that they either practiced superstitions at best or literally worshiped Satan at worst. Those shamans and medicine men were all of a sudden witch doctors. The Spanish went through the most straightforward route for fabricating Cass's belly. They merely claimed the right of conquest, while English, French, and Dutch settlers decided to hand wave elaborate excuses for taking indigenous territory. They claimed these people weren't using the land correctly because they weren't using it like they were, and portrayed the continent as a vacant wilderness with scant few nomads. They also tried to make out indigenous cultures as in dire need of change. Europeans saw fishing and hunting as leisure activities, so they interpreted the men hunting, women farming thing as indigenous peoples keeping women in near slavery. Monocles popped over their open sexuality, and so groups like the English felt pretty comfortable conquering them in an effort to save them and bring them, quote, freedom. And that's where we're going to pick up next time we do this series. European colonists and indigenous peoples had very different concepts of what freedom was. And the flexible definition of what freedom is precisely will be a running theme in this series. But until next time, the pieces are set up. What are the opening moves? So do you want to see the next video in this series? Let me know down in the comments. If you're dying to ask me a question about history or the world or how I get my hair to look so good, I have a Curious Cat account where you can ask questions entirely anonymously. Go to curiouscat.me slash tristanpej to ask a question. This video was made possible by these beautiful people, as well as the rest of my patrons over at Patreon. I'd especially like to thank Don and Carrie Johnson, as well as Colbine Mani for their generosity. The theme song is by 12 Tone, and come back next time for more Step Back. <laughs>